Vinit Rai, founder of IntelliCap and Avishkar. It's a real pleasure to be speaking to you today. I know you're rushing back to Delhi, but thanks for taking the time today. Um, Vinit, I was reading through your profile and I just wanted to talk a little bit about that first to introduce you to the audience. And what I found fascinating was that uh, you, know, you started your career in the forest. I think there was three years uh, that you spent working for the Forestry Commission in India. You know, you wouldn't have thought that would take you to venture capital and impact investing. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that experience in the forest? Because I remember reading a piece saying you'd wake up in the morning, there'd be 200 people out in the office expecting you to solve all their problems. What did, what did that experience teach you? Yeah, so, uh, a little back, I, go, I come from a background where my parent, my father was actually in government service yes. and uh, classical middle class background. Uh, India was not really developed at that time. We were struggling and developing. And uh, so, very average background and I actually wanted to go in RB. Yes, yeah, for some you're very passionate about the RB. Yeah, yeah, for some strange reason, they kept rejecting me. So, after yes. trying three times, I was left with no choice. A friend of mine told me, that, uh, okay, if you can't find human beings, maybe go and fight animals. Indian should have forest management oh, is looking oh, for sure. people. And so, in, a, in jest I applied, mm. I got through and the best thing I liked about the course was the building. Yes. It's a beautiful building. <laughs> and so, that can tell you how myopic I could be in my decision making. So, <laughs> so, I went there because I liked the building, completed the course. I was pretty young when I passed out. I was 22 years when I passed out. And my first job was actually a posting in... Uh, at that time, a very underdeveloped state called Orissa. Yes. And uh, even within that state, I was actually posted in a reasonably remote part of uh, where I was given so what I thought was a bungalow. My wife later on told me that it was a hut, but it looked like a bungalow. <laughs> it was a big bungalow. And I had roughly around 1,500 odd laborers working for me. Our job was to basically, I was working for a paper mill, mm. and our job was to harvest bamboo make roads, transport it to where it needs to go, to the paper mill. Uh, three years that I spent in the forest was quite uh, insightful to me, yes. partly because uh, as a very young person, even though you lived in India, you were actually living in a uh, reasonably developed part of India. And then suddenly to go into a forest to discover that poverty and my, uh, my real first encounter of real poverty, which I, when I was that? was that because poverty, you see people begging on the roadside, mm. but that actually is make believe poverty. I knew it as a child because we know Indians instinctively knew that this is not necessarily poverty. These people are professional beggars. Mm. But in the forest, nobody begged, mm. but you could still see potential starvation, people malnourished, etc. And, uh, and I'm, I always believed, because I wanted to be in army, I always believed I had a very strong heart. So, it was not that I was actually very depressed by what I saw. It was surprising, but not depressing per se. Uh, my job was to help them and whatever limited capability I had, I did. To me, the surprise in learning was nobody actually there wanted to beg per se. They all wanted either a job yes. or wanted to do something on their own. Yes. And that was my introduction to entrepreneurship per se. Now, it was not the formal entrepreneurship that we see uh, of today what I do. Mm. But it was a, what was very clear is people want to be self-independent, yes. dependent on themselves, not on others. And uh, I tried to help them. I f my first entrepreneurial activity was help people start uh, 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 nursery. Yes. And we will buy back the seeds mm. as from the paper mill because we were supposed to do plantations. Uh, I realized I had far too many limitations mm. in the job I was doing. And three years later, uh, my son was born and my wife actually said, listen, living around with crates and cobras is not really my fascination. With but she was very supportive through this whole story. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, she seemed to be fully yeah. behind you. So she actually told me that, can you find a job? And I actually tried looking for a job from a car salesman to anything that I could apply. And I got some whole host of 300 rejections oh, <laughs> everywhere really? I applied. Because people said, what will we do with a guy from a forest? Yes. And then suddenly, uh, Indian Institute of Management Ahmedabad, uh, which happened to be the most premier institute in India, <laughs> was looking for a person who has worked in the forest mm. and has worked for an industry. And probably I might have been one among the 10,000 people who would have met that profile. Wow. So they sent me a letter and even though there was no salary or effectively no salary, $50 or $100 was my monthly salary, 
I still had no choice to come out of the forest. Mm. I had to go, and I thought I'll experience what best Indian Institute of Management does. Yes. Spend nine months there doing research. And I realized I'm not cut out to sit and type papers. So, uh, in a brief conversation that I had uh, with the professor I was working for, he actually said that, uh, and his name is Professor Anil Gupta. Mm. So he said, "Okay, if you want, don't want to do research, why don't you actually apply for this position? Mm. We are setting up a business incubator." I had no understanding of what the word incubator meant at that time, but since I was desperate for a job, I applied for the post of manager. Uh, as luck would have it uh, i think they could not find a competent ceo so i became the ceo so at 26 i was the ceo of this my institution goodness. 300 rejection letters yeah uh, an applicant my God. wow we were sitting in the forest you can the only thing you can do is send out applications <laughs> as many as you can and uh, but it becomes depressing but that's actually the good part of me yes. i'm i'm actually not a guy who actually get depressed by rejection i've seen enough all my life so you don't yeah. mind it you can yeah. go through it i mean i understand i'm living in a forest if somebody looks at my resume this guy wants to be my car salesman yeah why would he qualify so i actually actually in in just i tell my colleagues in intelicap and avishkar that had i ever applied to any of these two organizations i would have surely got rejected <laughs> thousand times over because we will go by the profile and i my profile actually doesn't match up to be in this space is that a quality of an entrepreneur that you're describing now yeah so if you actually so i have a definition of entrepreneur yes. and my definition of entrepreneur is a man who uses his limitations who understands his limitations and exploits his strengths mm. and delivers within those limits and therefore he's not a manager Uh, but an entrepreneur yes. because he understands these two a manager uses his strengths to take his career forward an entrepreneur actually understands his limitations to build himself up that, that's very interesting yeah so that's essentially what uh, i quintessentially define myself as mm. as a guy who is very aware of what my limitations are so so now you are you are this 26 year old 26 year old ceo of an incubator probably bef before many incubators were even conceived of right this must have been a very early i think it was one of the if not the first probably first two or three incubators in india yes and uh, yeah so it was an interesting insight because we did not know what incubator meant and uh, so i went and discussed and we actually did a paper on incubation to understand and i realized that the concept of incubation was essentially providing space yes significant amount of space to people to have similar kind of businesses mm. and co-learning etc etc but the kind of incubation i was supposed to do was pick up farmers and their ideas and convert them into business which has very different connotations yes uh, to the incubator that i learned was in china or us <laughs> and that actually so this was more agri based Well, it was actually so. My job was to look at innovations mm. or innovative ideas of the farmer and see what we can do to convert them into businesses. Mm. Now, there are three learnings that I got in those four years where I worked with this incubator. First, an innovator need not necessarily want to be an entrepreneur. Yes, he is driven by the idea of coming up with a newer idea, mm. not producing the same thing hundred times over. Okay. So that was my first learning that innovators are not somebody you can just go and sell and create value for them. The second thing I realized which was a big learning for me coming from a gov mm. government service background my father was from government service and myself in a service. I tried to actually work with a very small time entrepreneur mm. and took an innovation technology from one innovator to him. Yes. And I said oh we represent the government and the incubator I represented was basically a government incubator. and i said we represent the government mm. we are giving you this technology you invest your money and you can make lot of money mm. so that guy who is actually a very i mean i would put him as a entrepreneur who come from a very humble background but done slightly better so he asked me one question he said and what happens if i fail and that question had never occurred to me till yes, that time yes yes <laughs> it had never occurred to you yeah because i am come from a job we, yes. my father used to get a salary every month yes, and yes. so did i yeah so the idea that something called failure happens which means uh, to me failure was getting a rejection yes. it did not kill me yes in this case if he failed it then is. everything goes yes so i said but why will you fail mm. he said but what if i fail and i had no answer i looked so stupid at that point of time that here is this guy and i thought i was so smart and this mm. thing and he just taught me that failure mm. is equal to risk and this man is taking risk 
with his life, with his life's property income, and he's putting his entire family at risk. And he said, so I said, so... What was his idea? What was the idea you'd given him? So the idea was that this man in, uh, in a very remote part of India has made a tilting bullock cart. Yes. Okay, it was a bullock cart that used to tilt so that you can actually drop uh, fertilizer. Yes. In a very aligned even, manner, in the, in yes. even manner. Yeah. Now, the innovator was not interested in producing more of these uh, carts. Yes. You know? So I actually said, if I find somebody who's willing to pay you for every card sold, yes. would you give the knowledge, know-how to this guy? So innovator agreed. So I went to this person and found this person and said, you will sell, I'll give you 28 orders mm. because I had actually then got a lot of orders collected. But you'll have to pay him X amount of money every yes. time you sell something, plus yes. you have to pay an advance capital. So he agreed to everything. And then when he started making it, I was having a conversation with him of why you are doing it. And he said, what after 25, you will help me for 10, 20. Mm. But if after that it didn't sell, mm. then I have invested so much money, I yes. lose everything. And the idea of failure was so new to me that it surprised me. And it took me a, a six, eight months of struggling to figure out. And then I asked him, so I went back to him, I said, so, so what is it mm. that I should do mm. that can ameliorate the risk that you're talking about? He said, you should, when you bring in new idea, mm. you should also bring in new money. Yes. And that money should have the ability to take risk. Mm. So you give me the money, if I make money, you take it back. Mm. If I don't make money, mm. you should just forget about it. Yes. So that was my biggest learning in life, mm. uh, that there is a need for capital. The other thing that I had learned while interacting with these people was there is a massive engagement needed. Yes. And uh, so in 2000, when I was 29, 2000, uh, I think 2002, exactly 2000, 2001, I wrote a paper mm -hmm. saying there are two aspects of engagement if you want to make rural India thrive like urban India. Mm -hmm. One, you have to take very high risk seeking capital. Yes to partner with these entrepreneurs. Yes. And the second is you have to create high quality manpower mm. that can engage with these people yes. to use the capital properly. Yeah. Because this was not about just actually giving them money and expecting them to yes. create business. So this is also capacity building, is yeah. it? Which I actually use the term intellectual capital. In okay. And Intellicap. Which is became Intellicap mm. and venture capital that became Avishkar. Yes. Now, this is a 29 year old who has never actually was a forester yes. trying to hypothesize about, but this was actually one of my strengths. I used to always, when I feel challenged, I always wrote, wrote down. Mm. And the thinking was that if I can use intellectual capital yes. to engage with these people with ideas and businesses and help them frame it up mm. and then put capital on top of it, probably success may happen. Mm. Now, it looked very nice on the paper. So with this great idea, I quit my job yes. with $100 as my mind. life savings. Yes. And uh, with the $100, with some uh, individuals supporting me and backing me, Yes. I actually started... This, this was the diaspora that you mentioned. Yes, this yes, is the diaspora. Yes, yes. Anant Nageshwan, Arun Dias, who still happens to be actually... Both, both of them are involved actually yes. even today in Avishkar. So they believed in the vision that you were talking about. Yeah, actually, I, I, I'm still amused actually because yes. these people were almost seven to ten years older than me. They were from the premier institutes from across the globe. They were in Singapore and they wanted to do something for India. Mm. But they didn't just want to write a check and forget about it. They wanted to be more actively involved. This whole idea of uh, setting up a venture capital fund to work rural India was exciting because they were all from finance background. Yes. So they understood that this, if it works, mm. might deliver very different kind of results. Mm. What they did not know is whether I have the capability to take it forward. Mm. But most of them actually rallied together. There was another gentleman, Jayesh Parek, who when I first time went to Singapore, that was I, till that time I had never left India. Yes. So they paid for my ticket, took me to Singapore, and there were some 30, 40 Indians yes. who collected in this one house where I made what I thought was a great presentation. And uh, then every, and I was of course uh, ragged like anybody else will be because I was quite young and very green. Uh, then they started leaving and one of the gentlemen, Jayesh Parekh, came to me. He had, he had really been very tough with me during yes. my presentation and said, so why did you come here? So I said, I came here to raise a fund. Mm. He said, but everybody is going. You seem to have come here to drink tea and go back home. Wow. 
I said, no, no, I came here, but what do I do? So he said, you came here, why didn't you ask for money? So I, I don't know how to ask for money. So then this gentleman actually stood up and told everybody that we are not here actually to come eat, talk and go back home. We yes. are here to actually listen to this guy and give him money. And I signed the first check and uh, that actually triggered and I raised $100,000 in that. In, in that, in that and that was your first capital raise? That was my first capital raise and that's when I came face to face with the grim reality of raising capital and bringing it into India to different things. Yes. And then they asked me, so how will you take this capital? In a bag? Yes. <laughs> I said, I don't know. They said, go figure out what is the legal mm. uh, context, how would you do it, what is Foreign Exchange Management Act, what is uh, controls FEMA and FERA, Foreign wow. Exchange Management <laughs> and these were Greek and Latin for me, I had no clue. I thought I will just take money, give it to some people and something will happen. Uh, next one year, one and a half year went in actually understanding the complications, yes. the legalities, the regulation. Uh, I couldn't hire a lawyer because the lawyer fees was $50,000 at that time and that $100,000 was the commitment I had yes. giving $50,000 to the lawyer. So I actually tried to do whatever I could on my mm. own with some support from Individuals. So you really bootstrapped it from that yeah, point. Yeah, there was, there was no choice at that Did point. Did you feel then. good when, when you got that $100,000? Did you think I've, 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 well, I, I've crossed the Rubicon, yeah, you know? Well, actually, if, I, if you ask me, I was very weighed down by the expectation because getting the 100000 yes. meant that you can no, no more talk, you have to deliver. Yes, Suddenly, yes. that reality dawned to me that uh, it is no more mm -hmm. just talking you have to actually get the organization and that requires patience. This is not about fanciness. Now yes. all was grit, grime, dirt and yes. really soiling your hands. And that is what the next one year was. Very painful, going through very slow regulatory process, yes. getting approval. Finally, in 2002, September, I got the approval. Mm. Uh, and in between this time frame, uh, yes. we, I was struggling to survive because we had no source of income. So I was doing odd consulting here and there. You, you, you're really up being an entrepreneur. Yeah, so. I was trying to survive and trying to raise the funds and trying to invest. And your wife was still behind you at this and point in uh, time? Yeah, or? I think other than, so it was my wife who actually I went to and so this was around early 2000. Uh, we had moved from Ahmedabad to, uh, to Mumbai. Expensive place, no money. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I knew my wife had $2,000 as her father has given her a gift uh, at our wedding. And I said, listen, now is the time because we have nothing in any case. Yes. So let's take the other risk and start this IntelliCap also. Yes, so, yes. And she said, so where will you set it up? I said, we need $2,000 to actually get legal and regulatory approval. And, uh, and uh, she said, uh, so where will you get the $2,000? <laughs> I said, you have the $2,000. <laughs> if you lend it to me, I'll give you 50% of the company. <laughs> So she was nice enough to lend it to me and I used it to set up IntelliCap mm. in March 2002. Yes. And uh, by end 2002, we made our first investment from Avishkar as well. And, and what, tell me about those first investments. Yeah, so that was an interesting one. <laughs> there was these two gentlemen who were all 60 year old uh, who had developed this burner, stove burner. Yes. Now in India, a lot of people use stove yes. for their cooking. Yes. And that stuff uses kerosene. It's the same here. It's the same here as well. And these people said that if you actually make a flawless, basically they're, they're, uh, what they told me and what I understood at that point of time is most of the burners are made out of scrap. Mm. And because they are made out of scrap, the combustion, the vaporization of kerosene not is not efficient. Mm. And therefore, the flame actually throws out a lot of soot Mm. The kerosene consumption is much higher mm. and it causes a huge amount of uh, carbon dioxide emission as well. So if we actually make a very high quality burner, then you can reduce uh, kerosene. kerosene consumption by 30% and they had designed one. Mm. Now, we didn't have great understanding at that time, but yes. it looked very good idea. So I asked, so how much money do you need? And they did not know about venture capital, so they said, so what will you charge? We said, no, 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 we will take risk with you. So they said, okay, give us $20,000. Yes. So I said, $20,000 looks very nice. So we <laughs> immediately agreed and we gave them $20,000. They gave us 50, 49% of the company. Mm. 
and uh, then we suddenly figured out and of course we made a very nice business plan that every year the graph went like this yes. and we became very profitable and five years time we made 30 percent return mm. and our investment committee was extremely excited so everything got approved I actually distinctly remember we had put in the business plan that in the first year we will sell 10,000 burners mm. in the second year we will sell 35,000 burners and in the third year we will send 70,000 burners this was actually our plan in the first year, we sold 135 burners, only 135 burners. Uh, in the second year, we reached 750 or 800 odd burners. Yes. In the third year, we were at 3,500 odd burners the wow. whole year. So we were off not by a small function. We were off by 95 percent every year actually. By 2005, we were off by such large margins yes. that everybody said that, and people started encouraging us to write it off. Yes. Me and one of my first colleague, Pradeep, we actually tried to sell burner ourselves to understand why the damn thing doesn't yes, sell. You went out, hit the yeah. street. Yeah, and uh, we wrote four or five things mm. in, in our memo mm. saying why this burner will sell. When I went to the retailers, they gave us the same four or five things of why it will not sell. Mm. <laughs> it was shocking for us because uh, so what we did not realize, and this is actually why, where what appears right is yes. not right always. Yes. So the first thing we thought that the, uh, this burner is actually energy efficient. Mm. Uh, it has a payback period, so people will buy it. Uh, but because, and we are making a, giving a very good burner, so it has a 12 months life. Mm. A normal burner lasts three to four months. Mm. So we said there is so many good strengths about our burner. It has a long life. It saves energy. Mm -hmm. This does. So the retailer said other burner goes off. People come buy and then they throw it away and come and buy in three months. You come and give me a burner which nobody comes back for 12 months. Mm -hmm. Why would I sell? Question one. Ah. So what we thought is their strength became our first weakness. Second thing he said, you are actually saying your burner has this 30 reasons why it is very good. And therefore, you charge two rupees over yes. the other burners. Do you understand this is an off-the-shelf product? We put it in the shelf, people come and take it. Mm. And, and people at this level don't want the best product. Yes. They want the, the cheapest, cheapest product. product. You are telling me to actually sell something which is two rupees more expensive. Yes. It's not that my margins are great. <laughs> but it requires huge amount of engagement. Yes. Why should I do that for you? Yeah. So everything that we wrote was the reason for our success, was all the reasons why we were failing. And uh, that's when I first time learned that India or most of the developing world, it's the best at the cheapest price that yes. sells. It is not best at premium doesn't sell. Mm. And uh, Mr. Mukundan, who was the promoter, actually took it to heart and came up with a new alloy metal mm -hmm. where he brought down the price. He was able to, so everything else other than the efficiency part and the, and the long term part uh, remained. We had to do a lot more sales. Today, Sarwals is yes. India's largest burner manufacturer. Wow. And we have actually got- How many do you sell now? Uh, I think we sell a million a year. Okay, so so, it's so a, that's interesting what the story you're telling me that one is that you're very very persistent you don't give up I didn't want to actually have my first investment written off <laughs> so that was actually a very clear idea I don't yes. want to go and say my first two investments went were completely written you off. were determined to make it work yeah. yeah and so despite a lot of our investment committee actually telling us write it off that they is. said this is what venture capital is I said venture capital is not about accepting failure all the time mm. you have to show success Yes. and then get into the game of cutting losses. If I have nothing to cut, yes. <laughs> well, cutting the first one is not great. So it was persistence and a lot of people stood by us at that time as well, backed us, allowed us to actually continue supporting that. And we have sold uh, our stake in those companies and made a significant amount of money. We made some eight or nine times of what wow. we invested. So can I come to that? Um, you know. I was I was thinking you were doing you you came across impact in investing before the term was actually created. I mean now it's a very fashionable term and everyone says they're doing impact investing. But you're describing to me impact investing in my as my understanding goes before anyone had really discovered it. Tell me something. Is it for profit? Is, is profitability to do with sustainable? What, what is impact investing in your description? So, 
So it's an interesting question and I have a very strong view there. Yes. Uh, I think uh, the term impact investing has got mired or lost into mm -hmm. the meanings and definition far too much. It's a very simple thing actually. Now if you go and ask any great venture capitalist, what does he do? They will not say they are looking for the 75% IRR company. No. What are they? They, they look for a good entrepreneur. Yes. They look for a good idea. Yes. And then they actually make an judgment of investing in backing that idea. Mm. They also take a macro view of where they believe this idea will go. Mm. Outcome is returns. Mm. And because you are actually taking risks, your input is actually the judgment that you are making, the entrepreneur identifying. And ultimately a great entrepreneur generate returns because he make more often than not right the right decision. Mm. An impact investor or so called impact investor is the same venture capitalist who probably tweaks mm. the venture capital principles slightly differently. Mm. Now let's we talk about Silicon Valley as venture capital. Now Silicon Valley has an excellent ecosystem. You have academics, you have investors, everybody within 30 kilometers. Is, is, that, is that creating serendipity in that environment? And therefore you have higher chances of succeeding mm. or being spotted, attracting capital and being successful. Mm. Because this creates a very, very positive mm. you know, self-reinforcing cycle for success. There will still be failures, mm. but you have a higher likelihood of succeeding if there is a significant ecosystem around it. Now, impact investing as I see it is not doing the same thing that is happening in uh, Silicon Valley, mm. but doing the same thing in places where the ecosystem doesn't exist. Mm. Where you have to identify the same entrepreneur identify an entrepreneur with a great idea mm -hmm. and basically trust him with your capital mm -hmm. to build a business which have an outcome. Mm -hmm. That outcome is money mm -hmm. and that outcome is changing lives of the people he is operating with. What people are focusing on impact investing is on outcomes. What they must focus on is inputs, mm -hmm. which is how is the investor going out of his way to take extraordinary risks identifying and going to difficult geographies, identifying very young first generation entrepreneurs, taking a risk and supporting them and building businesses that are creating outcomes both as financial returns and changing lives of the people. And of course measure them on both sides because a good entrepreneur, similarly a good impact investor should create impact mm. but his input is not impact, mm. his input is actually capital and judgment exactly like it happens in mainstream venture capital. Very so, interesting. So it's, it's actually very simple, but people because they are so focused on the outcome, confuse it. Outcome is important, but that actually is like somebody taking an exam and failing or passing. Mm. But to take the exam, you don't need to actually be very confident of passing or failing. It's an outcome. If you have read well, yes. you will score well. Yes. If you have not read well, yes. you will fail. Yes. Similarly, a good and bad impact investor is the one who should actually do the right things. Mm. And then get himself evaluated against what impact he has created. Uh, and that's essentially why, what our definition is. And, and Vinit, you know, people always think to set up a fund you need a few million dollars. It seems quite interesting that you started with just that $100,000. $100 actually. $100. <laughs> of my own and then $100,000. of your own, then the 100000 from Singapore. Yeah. And today, according to uh, what I was reading, you have 600 employees across uh, the businesses yeah uh, well actually across the businesses we are right now around 17 1800 uh, wow yeah but so this is an old yeah, yeah this sorry. is an old number yes. but uh, in avishkar we today manage 200 million dollars 200 million dollars we have made 50 odd investments yes and we have invested in india yes we are investing in indonesia i saw that bangladesh and yes. sri lanka as well now yes uh, and of course uh, africa Africa is on the anvil, so yes. I'm still uh, still actually trying to learn yes. before uh, and finding and interacting with people to see if we can actually launch a fund in Africa. We have some people who have shown interest to be yes. our anchor investor. Yes. Uh, but before I actually take that step, I need to make sure that we have spent some time using yes. Sankalp and IntelliCap yes. to build the ecosystem that I talked about. Yes. Yes. And to me. Trying to make investments without actually investing significant effort in building the ecosystem yeah. will so not yield. So ecosystem yield. comes first, then you make then you then you make the investments. Right now, to tell me something. You know, um, looking at the India 
that you know and understand and looking at Africa, do you see similarities? I mean, does it strike you that there are more, sim because you know, everyone's talking about South-South right. investment, you've seen the story of the BRICS, we're seeing much more investment coming into Africa from, uh, well, India has a long connection, of course, like myself, we have many Indians here from a long time ago, but what, 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 you know, what are you seeing at a macro level that, that made you pick Nairobi to try and en enter this continent? So I think uh, the one of the reasons sitting in India, we thought about Africa was, uh, it was, t so we had two options actually, go towards Southeast Asia yes. or come towards Africa. We had two options. In our minds, we didn't have any third option. Uh, we actually did both. Mm. Uh, Avishkar went towards Southeast Asia. This is Indonesia. Indonesia uh, and South Asia, so Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan. Uh, partly because of the reason I actually mentioned, to be successful as an investor, you need to be closer to your investments and you need to understand the ground rules very well. Yes. Uh, and I was not sure I understood Africa mm. as well. So my first instinct was to actually go to places which have three common themes. Mm. One, high density of, of people in the low income bracket. Mm. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, mm. all have very large number of population in the low income bracket. And therefore that density of population is critical for the kind of businesses to succeed. Yes. So I needed that density and I knew these countries have the density. The second thing is, I wanted to move in concentric circles. Mm. I was sitting in India, if you put a big circle around mm. India, these countries will fall in that circle. That means I should be able to reach there mm. and my ability to take decision should actually not be uh, underplayed because I don't understand. So we, India again has a long history with Indonesia and Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka are very close. So culturally also there is strong similarities. Uh, the entrepreneurial uh, expectations mm. and what people want to do is similar. So mm. it's not really very challenging except that the businesses might be small or uh, etc. But the, it was easier for us to make those judgments yes. and expect the kind of returns we were expecting in India. When I looked at Africa, what was very clear is one, it is not one single country, mm. it's a continent. Uh, fairly significant amount of variability, mm. large number of uh, regional and country national boundaries as well. So you need to first understand how things operate within these. So you need to understand the legalities, the frameworks, the regulation. Uh, the second thing was very important was I need to culturally understand what the entrepreneur is thinking. Mm. We understand in India today, I can actually look at the entrepreneur even if I'm not aligned with him, aligned with him, I actually still understand what he's thinking. I have a fairly strong belief that we understand the same about the Bangladeshi entrepreneur, yes. uh, Pakistani one, a Sri Lankan and an Indonesian. I am not so sure I understand it instinctively mm. about what's happening in Africa. So we thought building the ecosystem will actually teach and educate us of what is it that the entrepreneur thinks. The last three sankalps have helped given us significant insights mm. on what the entrepreneur want, what they are thinking whether they will be able to scale up, what challenges will they see, at what level they will have fear for scaling up, and what kind of talent issues you face, because we are facing the same challenges. Yes, yes. And until unless I face the same challenges and figure out an answer, my ability to contribute mm. other than money to the entrepreneur is very limited. Until the time I'm confident I can really contribute, I do not want to actually raise the fund, uh, because that's actually a lot of obligation yes. to not only make a contribution to return. So this is where we stand. Uh, I genuinely believe Africa is a great opportunity because you have huge diversity, you have actually significant amount of talent, which is all over the world. So you have a diaspora like India has had. And if you can attract that diaspora and create strong bonding partnership between local talent and the diaspora that is willing to come back and return, then you can build scalable because scale requires ability to imagine and imagination does not happen in isolation. You need to actually see people to being successful who were like you to actually get that imagination. We in India actually saw the Infosys, the Wipros yes. become successful. It doesn't matter they were in IT. A lot of us who are not in IT, similarly microfinance when it scaled up and succeeded, a lot of people left their jobs to start social enterprises because they believed you can scale and you can create scalable enterprises. 
I think in Africa, we need to actually see a lot of that happen by local talent. And once that starts happening by local talent, where people who are starting with 5,000 shillings, 1,000 shillings, 100 shillings, can actually build scalable enterprise, 10,000 more will participate in building it up. That imagination allows people to take right decisions. And I think that's what Silicon Valley taught me as well. Every time I go to Silicon Valley, what I realize is they are three years ahead of us in terms of thinking of where they are going while we are still talking about tomorrow. Mm. And that thinking has now started seeping into India. People are taking macro positions. People are taking macro positions and building it into, baking it into their business plans and then building their business. I think in Africa, because of the variability, because of geography, because of I think a lot of investors are also fly-in, fly-out investors. Mm. The local investing is just about starting. Uh, there is a lot of learning that has to happen. Mm. It's a very natural process. I saw it happen in India very rapidly. Uh, I think Africa is going through the same churn we were going in India between 2007 to 2012. And uh, uh, the more I come here, the more I see, I think you are probably better off as infrastructure. Mm. Because if you look at Kenya, the number yes. of incubators, the number of young entrepreneurs, the cool. I mean, I, we were actually in some school last year. Strathmore, oh, Strathmore Business School. The quality of students no, was they, just they good. Are, uh, they got something in their DNA. Yes, it was yeah. just incredible to see. And that actually yeah. tells you talent is not an issue. Yes. One has to actually create more Strathmores mm. to do that. But talent is not an issue. We just need to create that. And it is all bubbling on the surface. It's just a matter of time, whether it will take one year or three years. I don't see Africa uh, as a continent and East Africa specifically and Kenya particularly uh, being very far behind anything that is happening in India or any other part of the world. So now you've got, uh, you've got some employees here, I think 10, you've got an office, yep. you're on the ground, you've had how many Sankalp forums so far? I think this is the third. This is the third one, yes. lots of buzz, lots of excitement. What differentiates you? from everyone else? <laughs> well, that actually, uh, it will be an embarrassing uh, answer to give, but I, th I think the difference probably is that uh, we commit very long term. Yes. And uh, we don't commit because we are expecting something from coming here. Mm. Uh, our excitement of being in Africa is because we are coming here to learn and we are coming here to share. Mm. Uh, I don't think so we can teach people something, mm. but we can share our learnings that took place in uh, India and the learnings that we are taking to Southeast Asia and South Asia, those learnings we can share. But I think the quantum of learning that we will take back is significant and the relationships that we are willing to build uh, is what probably would make us different. So I think the three things, uh, on one side, we are very confident of our capabilities. As I told you, uh, I believe that we don't understand Africa but we know what we do. Mm. Uh, and we know that Africans are far too smart mm. to either see value or not see value in us. Mm. If they see value in us, then we'll be very successful. <laughs> if they don't see value in us, then I don't think so we're going to last long here. And last three years have taught us that there is some value uh, Kenya has seen, some value East Africa has seen, and therefore must be other things that we have done in India would continue to be valuable. So our plan is the following. We have come here with Sankalp, which is not a very big commitment to come. You come, you do something. Then we have created IntelliCap, whose job is to build the Intel local ecosystems. Now, the good part is, unlike India, there is a much better ecosystem that exists. So we have to just collaborate and actually pass our learnings and take the learnings together and build collaboratively. The third part is to bring our financial services side, yes. which is Avishkar, yes. which is our debt side, where we do everything from microfinance 10,000 rupees, which is $200, yes. to $20 million. Yes. Today, in my group, we do everything. So if you are an entrepreneur looking for $200, we lend. Yes. And if you are looking for $20 million, we can actually do equity investment of that size. So you, you, you've taken the whole uh, continuum. Yeah. Right? Because we believe that all kinds of entrepreneur must be successful. Mm -hmm for the ecosystem to actually thrive. You cannot actually build it only for the big, big guys. So you have to actually be considerate for those who actually are at a different level of learning. And the social strata is so very diversified. So why would you actually make a product only for one? 
uh, the social strata will change, but the social strata at the bottom is very large and our interest is actually taking those at the bottom as far possible to the top. Uh, I know nobody has figured out a solution and I don't think so we have a solution, but that's the ambition. And uh, our new ambition is actually in the service of the other 3 billion. Yes. Because the world is in the what service of the a, top 4 billion. What a great tagline. <laughs> yeah, so we are actually in the, bil our belief is we are in the service of the other 3 billion. Yes. And if we manage to even do one tenth of that, mm. we would have actually done a wonderful job and feel proud of it. So. Couple of questions. Most successful investment you've made by your criteria? I think the most successful investment I have made is a company called Equitas yes. uh, by all criteria. Uh, so this was actually an investment uh, where I met this gentleman uh, Vasudevan mm. uh, over dinner mm. and uh, I did not know him. Uh, he also did not know much about him. He had actually come to hire IntelliCap to investment bank mm. uh, in Hyderabad. I happened to be in the office that day. and. Uh, he said, uh, would Vineet like to have dinner with us? And one of my colleagues, Anurag, told me that, Vineet, do you want to have dinner with Vasu? And so we went on dinner and Vasu criticized all investors, mm. saying, you guys have no appetite, no capability to take risk. So I said, why are you saying that? He said, because for last one year, people are just negotiating term sheets with me. Mm. I said, oh, maybe you've gone to the wrong guy. So he said, if you are the right guy, can you make an investment in four days? Uh, I said, uh, four days nobody can make investment. He said, that's what, you guys <laughs> don't have the guts to take decisions. So I said, so what do you have? He said, I have a business plan and I have a certificate that I have a non-banking finance company. Uh, what due diligence would you do? You trust me, you have the courage, give me money and I'll show you what we can do with it. Uh, I said, okay, uh, I called my partner who was in Chennai and I said, let's actually start our due diligence tomorrow. Let's see if we can reach a conclusion in four days. We actually made that invest in, investment in 15 days flat. Wow. From that dinner, finished the due diligence in the fourth day. Of course, I couldn't give him money in four days. Yes. Uh, but the 15th day, money was in his bank. Wow. 1.5 million dollar is what I invested. Uh, that company yes. started, made its first loan with our capital. Yes. It's going for listing next month. In, in, uh, in India. Yes. Uh, it currently is close to uh, 600, 700 million dollars in assets under management. Uh, it has raised, if I'm not wrong, around 350, 400 million dollars mm. uh, in equity. You're still to invested in it. I still hold stake and we will make our first ever exit from startup to IPO. That this will IPO. be your first exit. This will be our first, not our first exit, this is our 21st. Your first IPO exit. Our first IPO exit. Mm. And uh, since we invest in all companies, every company I've invested had zero revenue, this will be a great achievement because this is a company where we have gone in without any revenue yes. and the company is doing an IPO. Uh, all credit to Vasu because we did not play any great role. It was he who actually played the role in making us proud. Yes. Uh, but uh, for if you ask me, the pride is not because he's doing an IPO. Yes. The pride is that Vasu redefined the meaning of microfinance. How? So, to your surprise and to my own surprise, Vasu actually told me, Vineet, I don't believe microfinance makes impact. Mm. So, I am going to make impact. Mm. And we said, oh, how will you make impact? He said, every client of mine would receive food mm. at a discounted price, would receive education, their children will receive education at discounted price, will receive housing mm. and will receive health services all at discounted price. Today, Vasu actually using Equitas as a foundation mm. and they actually transfer 5% of their profits to the foundation. Every time we make money, we actually make a donation to that foundation wow. out of him. And he serves millions of people 20% cheaper food than any retail investor will serve anywhere. So he runs massive logistics, food delivery, education and health services in addition to building this and all has been achieved in 8 years. My goodness, what a now, story. Yeah, and this is just incredible because if you go there for looking for microfinance, you will see one of the most incredible logistics chain. You will, do, you will find one of the most interesting food delivery mm. mechanism. You will find health and education all in a microfinance company which makes no money by doing anything else. My goodness, your most difficult situation. 
<laughs> most difficult there are many actually uh, we normally make a, a judgmental investment so we basically so as i told you as i wrote a story about myself we take positions so we made an investment in a biomass based uh, power plant yes but the team that we invested in actually and our analysis was that biomass based power plant do not succeed because power plant do not have access to biomass mm. so most people know how to run power plants they don't know how to get biomass so we found people who are actually running biomass plantations and we told them why don't you we will give you money you start a power plant uh, we did everything right except that the team did not have the capability to actually manage the power plant project per se and overran the cost by significantly we had to convince the promoters to step down bring in a new promoter who knows both biomass and the power plant and we have just about finished the restructuring process it's a very painful four year project uh, we will still be able to return our get our capital back hopefully keep our fingers crossed but it has been painful because it was no fault of the promoters uh, we we know they are not fully in wrong uh, we played the role in convincing them to move there we put in the capital so our investors capital is at risk uh, they have to lose quite a lot in the process uh, uh, and it was painful because it was a very tough decision to actually ask the promoters to step away from the business Uh, but given that capital is important and you have to keep the business running we had to take those decisions so it was a tough one so you can take the tough decisions as well well we are actually known to take pretty tough decisions really yeah. yeah let me uh finish off with africa you're here we got the big sankalp uh, uh convention coming we're all excited about that what you know i've listened to you i think there is a big gap here that you've correctly understood and my, my in my experience i think you know you, you you're trying to excite the entrepreneurial ecosystem get them going and i think although you see lots of incubators around no one is truly focused on that that i can see and i think that's the gap you're approaching so we're really supportive of you uh doing this we're really excited to, to be a part of your uh uh convention in the next few days what i wanted to turn to you and ask you now is you know let's say you commit you get you 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 now see, see the opportunity what does it look like in 2 years time if if everything goes as i am predicting if they all align if everything yeah. aligns my personal view, so there are two two questions you are probably asking one is what we will do yes. and what i expect the markets to do that's right uh let me start with the easier one of what we will do uh, what we will do is we are actually looking to bring raise at least 100 150 million dollar africa fund under avishkar banner we are also actually expecting to bring our debt services yes. uh, from microfinance to venture debt to merchant finance mm. all to africa mm. uh, in next 24 to 36 months i believe either both of them or at least one of them would be here operating properly taking very high risk early stage bet but having capital enough to back the company during difficult circumstances one of the challenges of early stage investing that i have noticed is uh, people are going and investing in very early stage but do not have the capital to back up the growth and they are expecting somebody else to participate that doesn't work in very early stage ecosystems and that's what we have done incredibly well in india and are planning to do it in other parts of the world as well in africa i think we have a but much better chance of success on that those for so if everything goes right in my view from an ecosystem perspective we believe we would be able to make this place far more vibrant by bringing in this and we have seen in india every time we have done something we have seen a large number of people following and the competition that makes us better and makes everybody else better Uh, so that actually is something that i'm expecting by what we are doing in general the market looks to me mm. like that there is a significant interest in europe mm. in us mm. in india and in china in what is happening in africa it's very clear the diaspora in my view will play a very significant role there will be a lot of people who will come back and play a significant role and ultimately it will be and what i'm actually watching for is how does the diaspora connect with the local mm. talent that is there and create that aspiration 
because my belief is in three years time the aspiration will be different the only thing probably the local entrepreneur has to watch out for which is what we have been trying to tell people in india as well do not have misplaced expectation from the social entrepreneurs uh, side yes if you start what, focusing what you too much on Free valuation money. yes if you start focusing you see, too much i on found this problem because mm -hmm. i found people with great ideas coming in my office but then you'd say, okay, well, what's the, what number? Five million dollars. And you go, but this is just an idea in a briefcase right, right now, right? I mean, do you find that expectations management, coaching, doesn't that have a role to play? I think there are three parts to it, and that's actually what I'll go back to what I told you by venture capital. A good venture capitalist is not trying to give you 30% return yes. in US dollar terms. A good venture capitalist is looking to find a good entrepreneur, yes. give him the right amount of money, yes and back his instinct to build a great business. The outcome is he might get a 30% return. Yes. Similarly, a good entrepreneur at an early stage must consciously focus on building a good business. Mm. It does not matter how much you own. Yes. It does not matter what valuation you are getting. What matters is, did you build a good enterprise? If you build a good enterprise, you will be very wealthy. You will make more impact than anybody else. If you build a bad enterprise, doesn't matter what valuation you got, you will never be wealthy and you will never be able to make the next impact. So for all young entrepreneurs, focus on the basics. You got to get a good idea and focus on where you're going to be with that idea. Valuation is just a game of macros and it is a game of capital, supply and demand. And I don't think so, it really trails you whether you're a good entrepreneur or a bad entrepreneur. I will use this opportunity to invite everybody to Sankalp, which is taking place 24th, 25th, and 26th at Kenya School of Governance. And uh, the more people come there, the better it would be for the ecosystem and the better the learning for us as well in the process. Thank you so much. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you. Fascinating.